Tight. Mm. Okay. I need to check. Oh, okay. I see right here. All right. It's taking a second. Come on, computer. Okay. Um, yes, allow. Pastor, can you see the uh, the screen or do I need to share it? It says live on Facebook. Okay. Uh, access camera. Enable. All right. Uh, let me make sure. Uh, all right, we good. I think. Okay. Um, come back. All right. We would like to welcome everyone um, that is viewing, that is watching at this moment to um, our Hebrew uh, Descended Live Talk Roundtable Talk. Our guest uh, um, uh, speaker for tonight, not really a guest, but um, one of my spiritual fathers um, that is in the building on tonight, uh, none other than uh, Pastor Keith Wilkins of uh, Sons of Yah, Chasing Our History. Um, I am honored tonight to have him uh, um, to come aboard on tonight and um, to assist in teaching us um, and breaking uh, bread with us on tonight. So we'd like to welcome everyone on tonight on Facebook, uh, YouTube, and um, of course, those that are here on Zoom, we'd like to welcome you as well. So at this time, without any further ado, I'm going to open up uh, with a word of prayer. Abba Yah, we thank you once again for just allowing us this day. We thank you, Abba, for what you're about to do in this Bible study. We pray that you would brook each one that is listening here and abroad. We pray that you would bless uh, those that are uh, uh, soon to come on. We pray that you would uh, uh, give them whatever they, their needs are, whatever they're asking, whatever their desires are. But we pray that you would uh, open the doors and windows of Shamaim and pour out your blessings upon your people. In the mighty name of Yahusha, Hamashiach, we pray these things and we thank you. And it is so. At this time, I present to some and introduce to others, none other than Moray Pastor Keith Wilkins. Shalom, my brother, shalom. Shalom, shalom. Moray Douglas and Seven Day Harvest. I'm excited of being in your midst on tonight. It's a privilege, Moray. I want you to know I see this as a privilege, an opportunity to break bread with my brother and yes. his house. Amen. Hallelujah. I want to work with you, if I could, tonight on who was the message of the Messiah given to. History has to give us the precise answer. Um, when I was in the mainstream, I, I didn't call myself a Christian, but at the same time, I was in that system. We taught that this message was given to the world, but we didn't understand history and what the world meant. Let me show you an example. You had the Egyptian captivity. That's the world. You had the Assyrian captivity. That's a world. Babylonian captivity. That's a world. Persian captivity. Grecian captivity. Roman captivity. Those are worlds. If you look at the book of Hebrews, the first chapter and the second verse, we understand that scripture deals with worlds by faith. And what is really dealing with is the captivity of Israel and how their faith would allow them to survive what was the world called, a government and a religion that subdued the people that they brought into their world. Like for instance, we are in the Gentile fulfillment. That is a world. 
but we understand there's a captivity that we must add. The British Empire, the Atlantic slave trade. This is a different world. And when people understand world, you like you have the world of sports, you have the world of entertainment, you have the world of music. But when we hear world, sometimes we think world means a different planet. He's dealing with what? Government and religion that collide to form a world, a philosophy over a people. That's what we're dealing with. Well, unfortunately, because of this system, the Hebraic faith gets lost many times in these different worlds. And we find Israel taking on the gods of their captors. So what happens when they take on the gods of their captors, they're subject in all things to that world that they're living in, that time, that captivity. That's what we're dealing with when we start dealing with worlds, that time, that captivity. So we know the Messiah comes when? In the occupation of the Roman what? Of the Roman occupation. So now we're dealing with the Romanistic world. What are we dealing with? We know that the Roman world is influenced by the what? The Greek world. So when we look at that influence, we look at 70, 175 BCE. We look at the high priest That's Jason, I'm, I'm busy doing who stuff. sells Jerusalem, and he what? Then he names what? Jerusalem what? He, he sells out Jerusalem, and he names Jerusalem Antioch Jerusalem. We understand that. And then they start building what? Gymnasiums. Why? Because Jason, the high priest, wants to be accepted into what? The Greek world. And the only way to do that, he had to appease who? Antagonists. So when he appeases him, he what? He brings a gymnasium in. Then we find Zeus being at the altar, being built into the altar of Jerusalem. We also understand there's offering and sacrificing pigs at that altar. This causes what? the hundred year war with the Maccabees because they what desecrated the temple when they now bring Zeus in. So they mix the Hebraic faith with the teaching of what? The 12 gods of Olympia. And this is what's going on. The Jews are becoming Greeks in 175 BCE. They're beginning to come become Greeks. So we understand that what? We also hear about other things that begin to transpire in that time period, the high priests, the Hasmodeans, they move out of Jerusalem. They totally leave the area and they go out into the desert. Why? They're not in agreement with that. So what is happening? Jason, the high priest, is willing to offer and sacrifice the Torah in order for Greek citizenship to embrace Jerusalem. So we see that there's a mixing of the Holy Scripts with what? the 12 gods of Olympia. So what's happening? We see in that the Jews are becoming Grecian because too many times we read the word Grecian in the scripture and we think it's talking about the Edomite. Well, that's not the case. A lot of times when you hear that, they're actually talking about Hellenized Jews. That's what they're telling them, talking about. Now we know that in 146 BCE, what? What happens? The Grecians are defeated by who? The Romans. But they don't take Alexandria, Egypt, until 31 BC. We also understand in this same time period what is going on. The Hellenization of the Greeks over what? The Jews is still going on. But Rome adopts what? They adopt the customs of Greece. This is where this gets confusing in the scripture. Because many people think when you hear terms like the Greeks in the scriptures, that the scriptures is dealing with the Edomite when it's actually dealing with the Hellenized Jew. Well, what happens where the confusion come in? You say, well, Rome's in power now. So if you say Rome's in power, you feel like then, okay, then the Romans take over as Romans. What we have to understand is this. The Romans take on the gods of who? Of, of, of the Greeks. Where the Greeks get these gods from? They get them from who? The Egyptians. What do we know about this? We know that ought to the Greeks is who? Helios. We know Helios to the Romans is who? Apollos. 
If you look at the artifact that is still standing today, the Ark of Constantine, you will see nothing about the Hebraic faith on that Ark. Where the confusion comes from is when we hear that they endorse Christianity, we have some mindset that Christianity is the Hebraic faith when that's not the truth. When they endorse Christianity, they are doing it under Helios. If you look on Constantine's art, on the side of his art, you will see a picture of Helios, who he calls Apollos. Again, Helios is the Greek god of the sun god. We know Ra is the Egyptian sun god. So what are we saying? What we are saying is this. They have adopted the religion of the Greeks. The Romans never adopted the Hebraic faith. What we do because of Hellenization and captivities, we lose a variance of our understanding of the Holy Scriptures. So when we start reading them, we're reading them from a Hellenizational state instead of its pure form. And then translations and lit transliterations also affects that understanding. So what we find ourselves doing is teaching from the Greek method and the Hellenization that the Greeks have placed upon us because the Romans did not take us out of the Hellenization, they embraced it themselves. So we understand when we start reading the Holy Scripts, now we're reading them under the understanding that the Greeks would have had for the Holy Scripts. Even if you look at them, many of the scripts you read are coming from what? They were practicing the Greek Septuagint. But we understand that they wrote that in the intent of understanding the Hebraic faith. But we understand also in the latter part of the fourth century, St. Jerome does what? He takes the Greek Septuagint and he translated it into Latin. Now you got the Latin Vulgate. The King James Bible version is the Latin Vulgate. 90% of what you read today is the Latin Vulgate. And you will see some different discrepancies between the Greek Septuagint and the Latin Vulgate. Well, well St. Jerome says this. He says, I could not understand many of the writings. So I gave my own understanding to that which I did not understand. So what did he do? He interpreted it based on his viewpoint. What else did St. Jerome do? St. Jerome added to the Hebrew Bible. Many scholars will tell you that the Greek Septuagint was act actually what? That it was accurate to the Hebrew scripts. We know that St. Jerome added to those Hebrew scripts. So what else do we now understand? We understand when we pick this thing up right here is based on the influence of the Latin Vulgate. So we understand there's many translations that are inaccurate. Like for instance, the scripture will tell you that they were in captivity in Egypt 430 years. That's inaccurate. It's 215 in Canaan, 215 in Egypt. But yet the Greek Septuagint tells you 215 Canaan, 215 Egypt. Even if you start breaking down the timeline in Genesis, then you understand from Jacob until his death, until Moses leads them out of Exodus is 215. We understand that from the time Jacob gets there until Moses leads them out of Egypt, is 215, but we also know that Israel dwelled in Canaan for 215 years. Now, the apostle Paul says this. He, he talks about from the time that Moses received the law is 430 years, but he's not trying to say that it's 430 in Egypt. So what we have is the influence of the Greek Septuagint broken down into the Latin Vulgate. So you have a mixture of the Latin Vulgate and a portion of the Greek Septuagint that brings you the modern day scripts that you understand. Here's the thing. What is the Messiah saying that we can accurately pinpoint? Let's look at this. Now, Pompey sacks Jerusalem in 63 BCE. 
but he does not destroy the Holy Scripts. There's a reason why he's not destroying the Holy Scripts, because there is a Pontifus Maximus over him, who would be Alexandria, who wins that seat of the what? High Roman Bishop in 67 BCE. He wins that seat. Now he's also the head general of the Roman army and he's the Pontifus Maxima. That is huge, why? Because the Pontifus Maxima did not need the Senate of the Roman Republic to what? To write moral and spiritual law. So when Pompey sacks Jerusalem in 60, 63 BCE, he can't destroy the Holy Scripts without permission from who? Julius Caesar. Now we understand what did he do? He rents the, the bell of the temple from top to bottom. Where do we know that that happened again? We know Matthew 27 and 51 tells us that when the Messiah gives up the ghost, the bell of the temple is rent from top to bottom. What are you saying? The influence that the Romans had over Jerusalem when it come to understanding the Hebraic faith has now been nullified through the Messiah. And the reason why the veil of the temple is being rent from top to bottom in Matthew 27 and 51, because it signifies what Pompey did in 63 BCE, when he rents the veil of the temple from the top to the bottom. So this is playing a role with what Pompey did in 63 BCE. But you would not understand Matthew 27 and 51 if you don't know about Pompey and him renting the veil of the temple from top to bottom in 63 BCE. But what did that signify? Though I'm going to allow the high priest to keep the holy scripts, these holy scripts will be scrutinized by Rome. So we know in 63 BCE, the Romans are now scrutinizing the holy scripts. This is what's going on. So now we understand they begin to put their authority in place around 60 BCE. What happened? The Herodian dynasty is now in charge of what? The Judea Jerusalem area. We also understand that Edomite that you call Herod, he what? He grew up in the Torah. This is why John the Baptist is confronting him because he knew the law and he was in violation of it. John would never confront an Edomite just for no reason. It would be outside of the traditions of who? Of our people and our culture. Why? I will explain that tonight, just how pinpointed the Holy Scripts are to Jerusalem and not the Gentile, the Edomite, not the Roman, the Edomite, but the Hellenized Greek, which is a Jew, the Hellenized Roman, which is a Jew. I will explain that tonight. Now, understand when we're dealing with this, we must understand that the Holy Scripts are under scrutiny. How do we know this, Pastor Wilkins? Because if you go into the historical documents, you will find an edict from who? Octavius. Who is Octavius? His name is Alexander. I mean, his name is Augustus, excuse me there. And Augustus means the great one. He is the what? Great nephew of Julius Caesar. Understand Julius Caesar is not an emperor. He's a dictator and he has authority over Rome through being the Pontifus Maximus. We also know that history tells us that the first five emperors of Rome are from the Julio-Claudian dynasty. All five emperors from Augustus to Nero were Pontifus Maximus. What did that mean? They had full control over the literature that was in Jer Jerusalem, Judea, and the outermost parts of the Ju Ju Jewish world. Hear that. This is why you hear the Messiah in so many scriptures go and tell no one 
Why? He's, it's not that he's trying to hide his identity. He knows that the philosophy of the Romans and what they have allowed as Judaism is not the same as what he's teaching. Well, what the historians did, they manipulate this circumstance and now they make Christianity a part of the Hebraic faith because of this technicality and many other technicalities that takes place from the time of the Messiah until 70 AD. So now this is what we understand before I go into the scriptures. I need to explain this so you would understand that Greeks were Jews, not of, they were bloodline Greeks that were Jews. They were Jews that were of Greek citizenship. That's what we're dealing with. So a lot of times when you see uh, Greeks that had uh, 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 Hebrew writings on stones and stuff like that, that's not the Greek the Edomite, that's the Greek, the Jew. That's what you're dealing with. Let's go into the scriptures if we can. Watch this. Now, I need to explain a couple of things if I could. The first thing we need to understand, the scripts were given to Israel only through Judah. Hear that. The scripts were given to Israel only through Judah. Understand what I'm saying. Israel broke from Judah. Why did they break from Judah? Because they didn't want to be under what? The David dynasty. They did not want a part of that anymore. So what happened? They break. So now you have the northern tribes, 10 tribes in the north, and you have the southern tribe, three tribes that make up Judah in the south. So the tribes in the south would have been Judah, Benjaminite, and Levite, because you can't practice the law without the Levite. Well, the tribes in the north would have also had Levite priests in their ranks before they started going under the influence of evil kings of other empires, and their kings were evil as well. Now, let's break this down. Let's understand what I'm saying. The scripts were only given to Israel through Judah. So what is Israel? This is the part we have to explain. Israel would be the adopted that the scriptures are talking about. I'm gonna prove that tonight. Israel would have to be the adopted that the scriptures are talking about. Where you get in trouble is that you don't understand that Jews were considered to be Gentiles, Jews were considered to be Grecians, and Jews were considered to be Romanites. Hear that. These were Jews under the citizenship of Rome. These were Jews under the citizenship of Greece. That's what you're dealing with. Now, watch this. So if we look at the scriptures, Matthew 15, we have to start there. Let's look at Matthew 15, and let's look at the 24th verse of the scripture. Watch this. But he answered, and he said, I'm not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Who is he talking to? He's talking to a daughter of Ham. Uh, he's as a Hamite. Now we have to understand that this is deep that he's making this statement. Why? Because we know that Abraham dwelled amongst the Canaanites. We know that he's, he can speak the Phoenician language. If you look at the Paleo Hebrew and you look at the Phoenician language, you'll find the first five letters of both alphabets are exactly the same. Why? Because our people are known, we're famous for mixing with who? With the Canaanites, with the what? With the, uh, 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 with the Egyptians, with the Phoenicians. This is what we did. We could speak Chaldean language. We could speak Phoenician language cause we intermingle with them. The sons of Judah, the sons of Israel were known to mingle with these people. So what we understand, he's rejecting someone that we mingle with. Why? Because the message is Judah's message to Israel. And it's the reason why it's Judah's message to Israel is because the lion of Judah comes through is comes to Judah and not Israel. Why? He's the seed of David, and Israel rejects the dynasty of David. So now we know that he's the seed of David. Now what has to happen? Israel has to be adopted in. And the scripture tells us why they have to be adopted in. 
But he said, I come not but for the lost sheep of Israel. Yet this woman is of the descendants of folks that Israel has always intermingled with. So he's telling you that the completion of the Torah will be based on Israel. That's what he's telling you. Then he narrows that down. Let's look at how he narrows that down. Watch this. He takes it a little deeper than that. So now we know that it's Israel, but look what John, uh, let's look at John 4. Watch this. John 4, and he's having a conversation with a Sumerian woman who is also a Hamite. Watch this. He said, ye worship, ye know not what? For we know that the worship for salvation is of the Jews. So he's telling you that salvation has to come through the Jews. The completion of the Torah is based on the eyewitness that the Jews eyewitness. That's what he's telling you. The Israel did not witness the Messiah and it's because they broke from the David dynasty and he's the seed of David. So when they broke from that dynasty, now salvation is of the Jews and they have to be adopted in because Jew means Judah. The other 11 tribes are not Judah. So they have to be adopted in to this salvation that is of the Jews. This is what the Messiah, this is what Hamashiach is saying to this woman is going to take an adoption into this salvation. But the Edomite then turns and twists this salvation into Judaism. It's not Judaism. There's no such thing technically as Judaism. Hear that. In the Hebrew faith, there's really no word called Jew. There's no such thing as Judaism. We know the J is less than five, is roughly 500 years old. If you do your history, the name Jesus don't even hit the Holy Scripts until 1769. Yet the name was in circulation as early as 1525, that J was in circulation. And history proves that that name Jesus was also known as the Jesus Labuck, which was what? a slave ship by the Queen Elizabeth Monarchy, the King Henry Monarchy. They own that ship. It's a German ship that they bought and it also went into battle. We know that John Hawkins is the captain of that ship. He is a slave trader. And he also made him and his crew pray three times a day, even though they raped our women and children on the upper deck. But let's deal with this thing from the point that we need to understand it. We look at the scriptures and our understanding becomes Hellenized. So we need to unwind from what we're doing. I'm guilty of teaching it the opposite way because I didn't know history at that time. Even though I've always been a student of history, my student, me being a student was based on the influence of the Western culture. Now, hear this. So he says that salvation is of the Jews. So if Judah, Judah, Jews mean Judah, that means Levites, Simeon, Benjamin, they have to be adopted in. But we know Levi and, and Benjamin are considered to be Judah in the Southern Kingdom. Hear that. So he's saying that salvation is of the Jews. This is the claim he's making. So we understand that he's here for the lost sheep of Israel. No other reason other than to fulfill the Torah, according to the scriptures, to fulfill the law. And we understand three levels of the law. The law was what? Verbal, the law was written, and the law is spiritual. Well, he's coming to make the law spiritual in our heart. That's why the scripture says, write the law. The law has been written on the tablets of our heart. Because we know the law is in three forms. Two forms are completed before he comes. The first, I mean, the one form is completed before he comes. He will finish the second one and usher in the third one. Let me say it like that. So the first one is mouth to mouth from the most high. So when he writes on his, with his finger and he puts it into a tablet, that's when you understand this is now being written of the Messiah. Why? Because in the beginning was the word and the word was with Yah. That's John 1 and 1, 14th verse, that word becomes flesh 
and dwells amongst us, but it was tablet before it was flesh. Hear that. Now, understand. So the first level was mouth to mouth. We know that Abraham, he kept law, stature, and commandment, but yet the law was not written down, so he was getting it mouth to mouth from the Most High. We know Hebrews 1 and 1 tells us in sundry's time, Yah spoke unto the prophets, and it tells you, he, they was hearing him in his ear, but in the day of the Messiah, when he ushers in the spirit of truth, it's a quickening in us based on the word that's in us that Yah is now speaking to us in the individual form. This is why Peter says you are a royal priesthood. Why? Because it's no longer an outside priest outside of you, but because you have received the spirit of truth, it's an impulse that controls your priesthood. So that impulse is seeing your priesthood is thou. But if that impulse is based on Torah and the law, your priesthood is alive and well. That's why the scripture she said, for it is your spirit that bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of Yah. That's what that means. So now we know that he lays out salvation in its true form to who? Judah. Why? Israel breaks from the dynasty of David. That was bad. It's worse than people think. Why? They cut off the lion of Judah to break from David because the lion of du Judah is the seed of David. So this is why he's not saying salvation is of Israel, but salvation is of the Jew, because he has to come through what? David's seed that Israel has rejected. They were tired of the dynasty of David being the authority. There's other reasons, but that's the primary reason. So now we understand that he came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. We also understand that salvation is of the Jews. So we know that the salvation that he's offering is to the Jews, is to Israel. But you're dealing with levels of Hellenization. So when you read the scripts, you're gonna hear levels of Hellenization that you think he's talking to the Edomite. Now, let's keep it going. Understand this. This is the next thing. Who were the Greeks and the Gentiles? Let's look into that. Let's look at Matthew 10. Yeah, excuse me, I'm a brother that keeps notes in front of me, so y'all pray for me. Matthew 10, and watch this, fifth verse. These 12, Messiah, Hamashiach sent forth and commanded them, saying, go not into the way of the Gentile and into the cities of Samaria, enter ye not. So if salvation is an Edomite salvation, as the Catholics tell you, the Messiah is telling you that he's saying, go not into the way of the Gentile. He's talking about the Edomite here. He's also saying not to enter into the cities of the Samaritan. Why? Because we understand by Job that these people would be the, they would what? It help us to be enslaved and give us over to the Grecian. Grecian. We understand that G, uh, G, uh, Genesis 10, excuse me there, tells us that what? That Canaan shall be the servant of who? They, uh, that, that, Shem, that Ham shall be the servant of who? Uh, Japheth. So we understand that they will serve Japheth. Well, how? Through the tents of who? Judah. Through the tents of who? Shem. So they'll sit in the tents of Shem getting what? Servants from who? The Hamites. So he says, don't go into the way of the Gentile, nor enter into the city of Samar the Samaritan cities. Watch this. Heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely I have ye have received, and freely ye give. Wait a minute. So you're telling me Judah has in their ranks folks that need to be healed, folks that need to be cleansed of, of leopards, raised from the dead, cast out devils, cast out devils in Judah. And the reason why he's saying this is because he's speaking of the Hellenized Jews that Paul himself encountered on Mars Hill. And what was they doing? They were too superstitious for Paul. The word superstitious is an indigenous word that would say too religious. What religion? They of the what? Of the Grecian faith. They stay up under the 12 gods of Olympia, the unknown God. 
That was what the altar said, the 12 gods of Olympia. So now listen to what he says. Ninth verse, provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your person. He says, this is not about financial things. This is a spiritual revolution that has been promised from the day of Joel, that in this day, he would pour out his spirit. That's what he's talking about. Now, so we understand that he's telling you to stay away from the Gentile, yet the Catholic faith, as you believe it, that the message is the Gentile message. The Gentiles jacked that up. They had control of the message and they jacked it up. We know this. Watch this. Now watch what happens. Now, John tells us this, Israel only. Let's look at John 12. Let's look at John 12. John 12, and if you would, look at the 19th verse of John 12. The Pharisees wherefore said among themselves, perceive ye how ye perceive nothing. Behold, the world is gone after him. What world? What world are they talking about? The Hellenized world has gone after him. Not the world as far as the Romans and the bloodline Greeks, but the Hellenized world has gone after him. The Pharisees and the scribes knew these Hellenized people. Why? They understood Tiberius Alexandria. Who is Tiberius Alexandria? He's a Jew that puts down the Jewish what? That puts down the Torah that he might advance in the Roman Empire. And it worked. Why? Titus did not take down Jerusalem in 70 AD. Alexandria, Ty Tiberius Alexandria, who was a governor in Judea as a Roman took down Jerusalem in 70 AD. Titus did not have the military experience and he was not a proficient general, but the greatest general in 70 AD was Tiberius Alexandria, who was a Hellenized Jew who had the Roman citizenship and he totally denounced the bloodline of Judah. Hear that. That's why the scriptures say that some sin is unto death. That's unto death. He denounced the bloodline of Judah and now he's standing in Jerusalem in 70 AD at the siege on Jerusalem. And then we see prophecy taking place. Why? Because it says when the armies come past around and about Jerusalem, now the end draws nigh. Well, you would, you would hear the Edomites say, they would have you believe that that Ashkenazi Jew will be surrounded by armies. This happened in 70 AD. I'll do a teaching on that to prove it in the near future. But what happens, who was those armies that surrounded Jerusalem? Local tribes, hear that. We understand that Israel is in Northern Africa before all the map manipulations and all this other variance that the Gentile, the Edomite did, Israel was in Northern Africa. It's on the African Titanic plate. It's in Northern Africa. So what do we understand? They're being surrounded by what? Hamite armies, local Hamite armies is surrounding Jerusalem. Understand this, when you are in war, in the ancient world, if you want a victory, the local tribes would join you. So what is the Romans doing? from 66 AD when they got defeated at the Battle of Beth Harah and they come back with vengeance. They take in city after city and guess what's in that surrounding area? Hamite local tribes. So what are the Hamites doing? They join in the Romans. How do you know this in history? Because this is the Romans forte. What happened at the Battle of Liberia between who? Between Hannibal and the Romans. He left his general behind and they defeated the Romans in other areas. And so what then begins to happen in those Roman Isles? Local tribes begin to join Hannibal. Hannibal's greatest mistake was he didn't fight in that battle in Liberia. Had he fought in that battle of Liberia, the Romans would have never gotten the upper hand. So the Romans what? Their navy then what? 
takes back Liberia and those local tribes rejoin the Romans. That's how battle was done in the ancient world. What else happened with Hannibal at that time? When they sacked Liberia, they took what? His treasure stock and his supplies. So now his army is weak because the Romans have the wealth and the supplies. This happens in war. What happened at the Battle of Beth Harab, Pastor Wilkins, when the Romans are defeated by Judah, what happened? They killed more than 6,000 of them. So we know that the Republic was representing that battle because it's more than four legions there. So the Roman Republic was there. The Roman Empire was there. And they take their artillery and they also take their valuables. So we know this is true because history records behind the second wall at the battle at the siege of Jerusalem in 70 AD that they were literally fighting the Romans with their own catapults. What are the catapults? They put these granite stones on there. And what did these stones do? They would fall over that wall, but when they smashed, they would what? Go up like a cloud. So when you hear that the son of man has come through the cloud, he's talking about Titus. He was literally coming through a cloud of smoke with the armies when they took down what? Jerusalem. And what, what did the Messiah command them? To stand in the holy place. What does he say? He said, now the third wall has been breached and the high priest and those, those what? Those Zionist Jews are behind that third wall defending the holy place and the high priests are literally standing in the holy place giving up their lives. You have to forgive me, I'm a history teacher, so you're gonna get a heavy dose of history because the scriptures have to fit this history. And history says, when you hear words like the Greeks, is talking about the Jews. When you hear words like Roman citizens, is talking about those Jews. Watch this. Now, watch this. So we hear that, that, that he, let me get back in my place. We hear that in the 19th verse that they are going where? Into a certain place. And, and what? And the 20th verse. And there were what? Certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. These are not Edomites. These are Jews who are being converted back into the Torah and the law that are going up, but because they have Greek citizenship, they're being called Greeks. I'll prove that point through the scripture. I won't leave the scriptures to prove that point. Now we know that these Greeks that are going up are Hellenized Jews who are being converted back to the Torah, the feast days, the Sabbath, and the law, that's what's going on. Watch this. The same came wherefore to Philip, which was at, which was which, which was excuse me there, which was a Bethlehem, Bethsaida, and Galilee, and desire him, saying, Sir, we would, we would, we would see what? Hamashiach. This is what these Hellenized Jews are doing. They're coming to see Hamashiach because he's there for them. These are Jews, these are not Edomite Greeks. Watch this. We're going to keep moving. Let's look at 1 Corinthians. This is where the mystery explodes. So we keep teaching that the Greeks are Gentiles when the Greeks are really Hellenized Jews. That's what you're dealing with. Hellenized Jews. Prove it, Pastor Wilkin. No problem. Watch this. 1 Corinthians 1. And let's look at, um, let's start at the 20th verse. Let's look at the 22nd verse. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. Who is he talking about? But if we preach Hamashiach crucified unto the Jews, it's a stumbling block. Unto the Greeks, it's foolish. Now, 24th verse. But unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks. Unto them that are called both Jews and this verse is telling you so-called Greeks, not the Edomite, but the Hellenized Jew is being called both Jew and Greek. Hear that. Watch what he said. Watch this. Th that, that what? The Messiah. The, that the Messiah, the power of Yah, 
and the wisdom of Yah. So he's telling you that there are Jews that are being called Jews and Greeks. There are no Greeks nowhere in history that are being called Jews. Hear that. There are no Greeks nowhere in history that are being called Jews. Now you have Romanites that were what? Roman citizens that were Greeks that had what? That were Jews, excuse me there, that had Greek citizenship. Hear that. So in the Roman Greek world, they're not viewed as Greeks. I mean, as Jews, they're viewed as Greeks. Do your research. Romanites were Jews that the what? The ancient world called Greeks. So you had Judah that were Jews that the ancient world was calling Greeks. They were Romanites. And we know that the Romans had what? They also had Hellenized Jews that were considered to be Romans because they have Roman citizenship. We understand this in history because in 66 AD, there were things that happened that what? That they were tired of. And we understand also the recording of the Ketos War. What is the problem with the Ketos Wars of 116 under who? under Trajan, Emperor Trajan, and who? Emperor Hadden, Had Hadrian. Under Emperor Trajan and under Emperor Hadrian, what's the problem? You have these Greeks, these Jews, excuse me there, that are Greeks, and we understand this from the Quito's Wars. Why? Because Judah is tired of these Jews that are considered to be Romans, and they have all the, what? privileges of Rome, they are living in Jerusalem, Judea, Galilee, and all the areas that the Jews, the, the traditional Jews, control. So what happened? In 116 under, uh, under Trajan, a war breaks out. Why? They're tired of Rome taxing them, and they're not taxing these Jews that have Roman citizenship. So if you had Roman citizenship, you're not being taxed if you are in the providence where Jerusalem controls that territory. The Romans are taxing the Jews heavy for them to live there for free. And the Quito's wars break out of 116 AD. And we know they break out again in 118. So they break out under Emperor Trajan in what? 116. And then they break out again in 118 under who? Emperor Hadrian. And then we know they break out again in 135 under who? Who's, who's their leader then? The Jews literally endorse another Messiah and his name was Kabbalah. So they endorse him. Kabbalah is the Messiah that's fighting for, the, for who? For those rebel Jews in 135 AD. So we understand that Jews were considered to be Romans. Jews were considered to be Greeks. If you talk to any historical scholar, they will tell you this is exactly true. What they were trying to do is say it from a Western world and make the Jews as if though they were white. And the reason why they were considered to be Romans and Greeks, because it was hard to separate who was who. That is a lie. Judah knew exactly who these people were. Judah knew exactly who these people were. And they got in trouble with this mess in 175 BCE when the high priest Jason, which the name Jason means is a what? It's a Greek name. And what does he do? He adopts Garnasium. Why did he adopt it? Because it's popular for what? Grecian citizenship. So he brings Garnasiums into what? Jerusalem and Judea and areas like that. And what does he actually do? He pays the way for the Herodian dynasty that would come along 115 years later, even though the Maccabees fought to the death to prevent it, Jerusalem will actually become a Grecian state by the time the Herodian dynasty is there because they are in control. And that Edomite called Herod, that, that John the Baptist confront, he knows that Edomite knows the Torah, and his family grew up in the law. That's why he confronted John was not called to confront Edomite. 
he viewed that Edomite as someone who knew he was breaking the law. And that's why John is calling him out. The Messiah tell you he won't even talk to him. The woman of Samaria, he wanted nothing to do with her, called her a dog. Hear that. The woman, the Canaanite woman, wanted nothing to do with her. Why? He's not here for that. So how does the mission of the Messiah, the message of the Messiah, now leave Israel when it's of the Jews? You can't be saved except you take on the customs that the Jews, the traditional Jews, were keeping. So if salvation is of the Jews and there is no gospel, what do you think that salvation is? The completion of the Torah, three levels of the law. The completion of the law, three levels of the law. The first level, mouth to mouth. The second level, written law. The third level, law in our heart. For it shall not be, a, it should now the tablets of our heart and circumcision of the heart. So we see three levels of the law. Again, the first level, mouth to mouth. Yah speaking unto his prophets and they keeping this law. The second level, written law, when Yah takes his finger and manifests it physical, what does that do? It opens the door for who? Hamashiach to be manifested physically. Why? He is the law. That's why he told you that they wrote about him. Moses was writing and speaking of him. He is the law. So then we know the third level of the law is what? in the spirit for it is we now circumcised, circumcised in our heart and what did the messiah have he came out of the wilderness full of the of what the rock of God. so we understand that he comes out full of the rock keeping the law and what would be the final thing we would now be full of the rock keeping the law so we know those three levels of the law exist so when you try to say the salvation is christianity that's a forgery that's a lie that is the Edomites translation of the Holy Scripts. This is how they messed up the Holy Script. They get the books. Now salvation is being offered to them. But what did they do? They manipulated and turned it into an Edomite religion. If you're going to be saved, you have to come through the salvation of keeping the law based on when the Messiah came, they were keeping the law. They were keeping the law. They were keeping the law. So when you hear the message of the Messiah, it has been given to Judah, and Judah is to give it to Israel. It had nothing to do. It had nothing to do. Listen to with the Edomite. And look, watch what I show you. Watch this. So it has nothing to do with the Edomite. Now, if you understand the purpose of this, if you understand the volume of this, and the importance of this, because this is, it is important to understand what I just said to you. But if you understand the purpose of this, then you would have to understand Revelation. Let me let me see if I can find Revelation. Y'all hang with me for a second. Revelations, watch this. Watch this. This is what the battle is all about. Revelations 12, 17. And the dragon was wrong with the woman, angry with the woman, and went to what? Make war with her remnant, her seed, which keepeth the commandments of Yah, and they have a testimony of Hamashiach. Who is he talking about? Hold on. Who would be the red dragon? Who's under the philosophy of the dragon? The Catholic Church. What is the Catholic Church Institute over? Christian anity. So if the Jews and the remnants were Christians, why are you going to war with them? Why is that a war going to take place between the, the commandment keepers, which is a remnant, and the dragon, which is the philosophy of what? The Catholic Church. So when you hear the dragon, you're dealing with what? The Catholic Church. How do you know that, Pastor Wilkin? Because the scriptures tell us in Revelation that Satan has deceived the whole world. How did he deceive the whole world? Well, there's 7.9 billion people on the planet. More than 4 billion are either Catholic, Judaism, or Christianity. And Judaism is not the practice of the, of the Torah or the what? Or the law. That's not, Judaism is, Judaism is not the law. It's an Edomite term. Hear that. It's an Edomite term, just like Christianity is an Edomite term, and the Catholics are Edomites. Hear that. So how did he deceive the whole world? The same way he set up Eve. 
He manipulated what Yah said. Oh, so he told you that if you took of that fruit, that you would be like gods? He didn't say like you'd be like Yah. He said you'd be like gods. He manipulates what Yah said. So we understand that Catholics do the same thing. So we understand this is why the Messiah made sure that the gospel was, that not the gospel, but the, the message of the Messiah was held close to the close, close to Israel as possible, and the world has to be grafted in. It was never expected to be reinterpreted and translated into an Edomite faith. So the message of the Messiah, according to the scripts, and I'm talking about the scripts, is to who? Judah, given to who? Israel. Amore Douglas, that's my completion. We'll wait for Amore Douglas to come back. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Is there is there anyone that has any questions uh, to Amore? Any questions? Oh yeah, can y'all guys hear me? Yes. Oh, thank you for... Uh coming on uh yeah i like to is it possible i like to review this thing again because this thing is deep <laughs> there's a lot of information and i love history thank you pastor wilk i love history and and the history just opened up the scriptures more and it uh it, it just makes sense i like clarity and the more history i get on the scriptures the better my understanding of the scripture there is for me so i i tell you it was good i enjoyed it i would love to to uh oh man sit down and just man. take notes <laughs> really really take notes and just put this thing together i appreciate it i hope you guys keep it up because i'll i'll come every every wednesday if y'all do this i'll i'll be here I, I mean that's all i gotta say i'll be here i love the history so you know thank you if i can if i can like i say if i can get this thing again or just you know just watch it again man i i, I would truly appreciate it yeah, you'll actually be able to watch it again on on this page or on YouTube. Uh, just just go to um, uh, Hebrew Descendant, or you can go to the Sons of Yah because it'll be posted on the Sons of Yah's uh, um, um, YouTube page because they have a a YouTube page as, as well. Amen. And we thank you for tuning in on tonight. Yeah, I think I'm a. Um, I think I'm. I'm. Uh, that's part of my Facebook page, Sons of Y'all. I'm a part of that uh, Facebook, so I definitely will look at it again. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Can that be posted to my um, group page, Hebrew Honey Love, on um, Facebook as well? I think that uh, my page could really, really benefit from this teaching because Pastor Wilk is definitely connected the dots for us. I mean, if you had any questions about who the gospel or who this message was for and who did our Messiah come and um, bring this message to is Crystal. Akuta, Crystal. What is that address again? It's Hebrew Honey Love. We're trying to write it down. <laughs> All right. Hebrew honey love. Yes. Yes. Okay. And I'll I'll share that with your uh, your page tonight. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, bless Pastor you, Pastor Wilkin. Wilkin, yes. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead, Sister Hello. Stan. Okay. Um. In regards to um, what you were talking about at the beginning, uh, breaking down the um, the um, before before um, the Messiah showed up, you know, making that connection mm -hmm. and showing us about how um, history has to correlate with the scripture and everything. Um, who was that again that you said that um, was controlling um, in, you said, 63 uh, BC? Who did you say again was that that was controlling um, the uh, script? Pompeii, Pompeii sacks Jerusalem. Pompeii sacks Jerusalem in 63 AD, but uh, I mean, BC. But what he didn't do, he didn't take away the customs of Israel, even though those customs were contaminated. The... Um, the uh, Maccabees fought to the death 
to protect the law, stature, and commandment. And what happened is Ptolemy comes, not Ptolemy, Pompey comes in in 63 AD and he sacks Jerusalem. He then take, he rents the, he rents the veil of the temple from top to bottom. We see this happen twice in history when the Messiah gives up the ghost. He also, the scriptures say the ground began to shake and the veil of the temple was rent from top to bottom. So what happened was uh, Rome had control of the Holy Scripts of the, over the messaging of the Holy Scripts since 63 BCE. We know they had the actual Holy Scripts in their possession in 70 AD. We know this because of the Roman Imperium courts. Those documents are in there. Uh, um, Tatticus said this, he said, I only have privilege to the uh, Senate writings of the history of, of the siege on Jerusalem. He said, but he said that Josephus was privy to the uh, imperial courts in the, into the uh, imperiums of Rome, which were the secret documents of all documents. It's also alleged that they would not disclose that they had the Holy Scripts also. So when Ptolemy sacks it in um, 63 BCE, he does not take, he don't take the Holy Scripts. He give them back to some of the priests, even though he execute at least one third of the priests, he spared some. And when he comes out with the scrolls, he gives them to the priests. But those scrolls are technically under the jurisdiction of Julius Caesar, not Rome. They're under the ju di uh, jurisdiction of Julius Caesar because he's the Pontifus Maximus. What we have to understand that the Pontifus Maxima, the Roman Republic goes back to like uh, 510 BCE. They're, they're in existence then. We understand that the Roman high priest, which would be the Pontifus Maximus, goes back to 252 BCE. But the first, what Julius Caesar did, he changed the, the order of Rome when he wins that that office in 67 BCE, he then changes the order of Rome. Why? He, he then appoints his heir and his heir is the first emperor of Rome. What I want you to understand when I say that, even though his heir is not his bloodline heir, Titus is the first bloodline emperor of Rome. That's why Titus is known in the underworld as the son of God, because he was able to petition the Senate because he was his father, or himself was not a Pontifus Maximus. The first five emperors of the Ju Julia Julio Claudian dynasty, the all five of those are Pontifus Maximus. They get to write religious law and they don't need the Senate to do it, though they would send the school of Pontus to the Senate and, and to debate why the, pon why the Pontifus Maxima himself did what he did, the Senate couldn't stop it. So what happens is Titus has to, he forges documents in 72 BCE, I mean, in 72 AD, he forges documents. And I mean, 71 AD, uh, uh, let me get it right. 71 AD, he forges the documents and he gives them to Rome and he convinces Rome that his father would be a deity. So when his father dies, he becomes the son of God. That's really who's the son of God in the ancient world. And the Messiah himself talks about these terms when he's talking about the siege on Jerusalem. Okay, and then the other thing is, so now that we come to 2021, mm -hmm. who actually has the actual Dead Sea Scrolls? The, uh, the actual, actual, what you, what you just um, explained to us? I question the Dead Sea Scrolls for this reason. They don't okay. come to light until 1947. It's the same time that Israel becomes a state. I question that as manipulation. The reason why, this is what I tell people, the problem we have is other people know our history better than we do. That those Jews, those false Jews in, in uh, Jerusalem right now, they understand that the Hezmodim priests went into what? The wilderness. Where did they go? They stopped at the shores that you would call the Dead Sea. So those were the, that now they saying that those scrolls are from the traditional high priest of Jerusalem, but they don't come to light until like 47, 1947. What we know is this, that the Pontifus Maximus, who would have been, um, he would have been Nero at the time. No, it wouldn't have been Nero. 
the Pontifus Maximus would have been either Linus or Clemens in 70 AD. Now, what we know is that they had those scripts in the Roman Imperium. Those scripts remain in the Roman Imperium and the Catholic Church right now today have the actual holy scripts. They have them. This okay. is why they were able to take them in 463 AD and they erased and banned the name of Yah from the holy scripts. We know this is historical records because the Pope in, 7, 19, in 2017, he testified that the Pope in 463 erased the, the name of Yah. He banned the name of Yah from the Holy Scripts. So how would he know that if they didn't have the Holy Scripts? The Dead Sea, the Dead sea Scrolls, to me, is nothing but a, ver a, a diversion from where the Scripts are at. That's like, with the, uh, Ark of, that's like with the Ark of the Covenant. People say it's in Ethiopia. Why would Ethiopia have the Ark of the Covenant? When we look on Titus's artifact, uh, on his uh, Ark, on the Ark of Titus, we see that he has the menorah, he has the showbread table, and he has the valuable things of the temple. So we know that he had also the Ark of the Covenant, and we also know that he would have had the Holy Scripts. So where, are the, where would these things be right now today? They will all be in the Vatican. Why? Because the Pope is the Pontifus Maxima, which would be the, the high Roman priest. That's why they call it the Roman Catholic Church, because they never gave back what? Their authority under Catholicism to the Romans. They maintained that. That's why you view them as the dragon. Because history says they've been chasing Judah since 70 AD. Okay, so where they're talking about, uh, they're, they're saying now, um, in, um, and I'm sorry, I don't mean to take this, take up uh, too much time, okay. but it's just important for me to make sure that I understand correctly. So what you're saying is, is our holy, the word from Yah is actually still underneath because um, the exactly. National Geographic said that there is an underground vault underneath the Vatican that has, I'm not just talking about our history, but a whole lot of people's history underneath in that um, underground vault. So basically yeah. that's who they got. Yeah. Okay. We believe, that we believe much, through sir. history, we believe through history that the Ark of the Covenant would have to be in the Vatican in that vault. Right. Right. Okay, thank you so very much, sir. Again, anytime you want to come and mess us up, come mess us up on <laughs> Seventh Day Harvest. Y'all bless you. Y'all bless you. <laughs> Hallelujah. Sister, Sister Hallelujah. Come think, mess me up. I need. Hold, I love hold, it. Hold, up, hold up, Sister Lorraine. I think uh, Sister Denine had a uh, a question that she wanted to ask. Oh, I'm sorry, Mom. Go ahead. Uh, yes. Um, I apologize, I didn't get to the beginning of the study, so I'm gonna to have to watch it or record it myself. But I did want you to, to give me, um, hopefully some historical clarity on the the Greeks and the Romans. Um, it seems like, were, were they ruling uh, different geographical areas simultaneously? Because I'm thinking, you know, Hamashiach came during the Roman era, but um, you're talking about these people that were called both Jews and Greeks, you know, and, they, and they're using both those uh, and I'm, I'm thinking also about the statue um, at Daniel, uh, when Nebuchadnezzar's dream, mm -hmm. where it seemed like the Romans um, superseded the Greeks. So I'm still a little bit confused on how that all played out during that time. The, the, here's where the I confusion don't know if you comes from. Question, but <laughs> I understand what you're saying. Here's where the confusion comes from. Okay. When the Romans defeat the Greeks in 146, the problem was they did not take Alexandria, Egypt, till like 31. So they, they defeat the Greeks in 146 BC, but they don't take Alexandria, Egypt until like one until like 31 BCE. But what they did, they kept the practices of the Greeks. So what happens is uh, you can have you can make a strong case that the Romans and the Greeks are basically the same people. They come from Kitna, which is what the land of the Romans. So we also understand that there were Greeks that were called Romanites. But these were Hellenized Jews that were called Romanites. Now, what we also understand about that time period, you have to understand Judea was in between two warriors from two different places. You had um, you had the four you had the four kingdoms that the kingdom of, of Alexandria was divided into four pieces. You had uh, Ptolemy in Egypt, Alexandria, Egypt, but you also had antagonists 
he was over the other area. He ruled all the other areas. What happens in the scriptures, if you study the scripts um, and if you study history, the Romans stopped antagonists from attacking Alexandria, Egypt, because they feared had he attacked, he would have been too great for the Romans to defeat later. Because the Romans always had a plan, they're going to defeat the Greeks, period. But had he took that to Alexandria in one, I think it's like 175 BCE, he would have been too strong. 167, 175, it's in my records. I got uh, the research papers in my uh, records. It's either 175 or 167 BCE. Had he attacked and took Alexandria, Egypt, then he would have been too strong for the Romans. The Romans, they liked the fact that there were four, the kingdom was divided into four pieces because they could defeat either one of those kingdoms one-on-one. -on -one. Had he took Alexandria, Egypt, the Romans would have had a problem. And that's why they stepped in. We also know they got a little assist, assistant along the way from the Maccabees because the Maccabees was causing problems to both of those brothers. You had antagonist the fourth, and you had um, you had a uh, Platolome the fourth in around 175, and they they have they 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 have in between them Judea and Jerusalem's right up above them. So this is how they're controlling it through religion. Um, we also know that they what they defaced the altars uh, in in the holy temple with a pig, and they also introduced what Zeus to the altar. So we we know. That, um, that we were under the heavy influence of the Greeks and how the Greeks was teaching. We were under that. We also know that the Greeks banned the Torah, the law, in it's like 175, I believe. Um, it's been banned. And Jason is on board with that. And that's why the Hesmadine, the traditional Jews, go out and they build a community by the Dead Sea. This is why we have to know our history because now you got these false Jews saying they found the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1947, and they're trying to base it off of the traditional Jews, those high priests who were traditional Jews, the Hezmadines, and that's why you have this problem. But and, and yes, your, to the answer to your question, we were under the manipulation and influence of the Greeks and the Romans, and the Messiah was here to fix that problem. He didn't have time. His ministry was not long enough to fix the Gentile. He only had time to fix Judah and hopefully Judah would fix Israel. And then others can be grafted in. That's what you're dealing with. I hope I answered your question. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Sister Lorraine. Lorraine, you still there? I am here, I am here, I am here. I just had to handle stand before a minute. <laughs> I just wanna say I just enjoyed the session. I enjoyed this. The truth is real for me, okay? Uh, I learned so much in this walk of truth, more than I ever learned in Christianity. They teach the same thing every Sunday, every Wednesday. So when I go to voice myself, okay, uh, does anybody want to give me like the pinpoints here? Because you're teaching the same thing every week. Like there got to be more to it. You're leaving me hungry. So... April 9th of last year, that's when I came into everything and I called Daddy Douglas up. And since then, he just been feeding it to me, feeding it to me, feeding it to me. I'm not saying I'm perfect. Yeah, I, I, I fall at times, but I know to get back up again too. I like to leave myself transparent. You know, I want to learn more. You can't work with people that's always closed up, boxed up. So I like to leave myself open. Work with me. If you see me fall, please come get me. Come get me. If you say you're in my corner, you got to check me. I need people in my corner that's going to check me, not make me feel good. Because when you check me, that shows me that you love me. Love is action word. Don't tell me you love me just to throw it around. No, show me you do by coming to check me. That's powerful. Amen. Oh, man. So walking in this truth, oh man, you see the things from a whole new different category. I used to hate bugs, but now I see a caterpillar. I'm like, oh my God, you are so beautiful. Nature's so lovely. Now it's just like, 
you, you get a you get a different feel for it. I was never into nature, but now it's like, Dad, when we camping again, <laughs> you know? Please put up my tent before I get there. I'll even pay for room and board. You know, something to that effect because I, I, I want to learn more. I got it's like I, I need it. See, this right here, I like to call it my addiction. Man. This is what I want to be addicted to because Man. there's going to be somebody out here that needs to know the truth just like me. And I want to be ready. I want to be prepared. I want to be willing. I'll talk to you on this phone for two hours, but I, I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> There's not enough hours in a day for this, but it makes me feel so good on the inside. I mean, so it doesn't matter what I'm going through. I, oh man, it's it's just it's a, I can't even describe. It. You got to feel it for yourself. I mean, I mean. All right, all right, all right. Okay, I'm done. I mute myself now. I'll go for another hour. And thank you. <laughs> Anyone else need to ask Moray uh, Wilkins anything? Oh, you said if I need to talk some more, I can. No, Sister Lorraine. Oh, okay. <laughs> Never mind. I mute myself. Love you. Okay. <laughs> oh, you met Lorraine. <laughs> I'm mean, I mean. <laughs> Yes, sir. Anyone? Yeah, uh, I think you're on mute, uh, uh, Maury uh, Richardson. Unmute, unmute yourself. There you go. Shalom. 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 I, I'm sorry that I missed most of the teaching. My phone has just been terrible. My wife and I just come back from getting both of our phones repaired, but I wanted to ask Moray uh, Wilkins, because yes, I didn't get a chance to hear your, 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 your instruction. My wife and I, especially myself, had been on a uh, journey to understand the when I came into the truth, it was through Paleo Hebrew, the mm -hmm. brother had taught us. And so when I read the 1611 or any other translation or version, mm -hmm. I try to apply the knowledge of the olive bait I learned to rightly divide the word. I know in, in 2 Timothy 2.15, it tells us that we are to study to show ourselves approved. But because we've been indoctrinated, uh, through these different versions and mistranslations, um, getting back to the original oracle, how do we? How 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 would you suggest that that be the uh, path back? It's 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 not going to be um, possible to get to the indigenous level, but mm -hmm. uh, we see the formula when the when the Messiah said that when he send back the spirit of truth and the lead and guide us into all mm -hmm. truth, there's a reason why the book of Hebrews, the first chapter tells us that in the day of the Messiah, that it would be a quickening on the inside of us because it's to explain that we follow the truth based on the impulse of the word being put in us. We can now disarm that which is and that which is not. Okay. Okay. I hope that answers so your question. Yes, sir. We won't eat it. And that's that that's excellent because it's the Ruach Kakadish that bears witness to that truth. And so with it helping us discern uh what that good and perfect will of the most high is, then mm -hmm. as you were just saying, that we're able to better uh rightly divide the word and mm -hmm. not just for our own personal edification, but to align ourselves up with the will Amen. that the Most High has intended. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So true. So true. Amen. Is there anyone else? Any questions? Any comments? I just want to apologize for missing the beginning, but I'm here. <laughs> you, you, you'll be able to go back. You know, well, I know um, I can watch it. Yep. You know. Yeah. Uh, to, to 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 those that don't know, you'll be able to go back and, and view it again uh, on on this page and also uh, on the Sons of Yah YouTube page and also on the Hebrew uh, Descendant uh, uh, page uh, on YouTube. You'll be able to see you'll be able to see the whole thing in its entirety on on both uh, on all all three um, outlets. 
I had one other question, uh, uh, Pastor Moray, for the uh, Aki. When, and you probably, you might have touched on this because I heard some of it in an explanation. When we talk about the abomination of desolation, and, and I heard you making reference to uh, they desecrated the, um, the temple. Part of the teaching that a brother had uh, given us was that Anna Custy, the epiphany, I don't know if you discussed mm -hmm. him, mm -hmm. was part of that. Um, and then whenever we begin to understand the role Constantine and the Council of Narcia had, as to uh, continue the misrepresentation because of, I guess you could say, nowadays they say your pride, your ego, and, mm -hmm. and those are some of the uh, uh, adverbs or adjectives we use now, but then we could see that the um, pure spirit of evil had uh, uh, overtaken them that they would again try to ascend uh, above the most high. Would you know it's strange what you said, the abomination that makes death? Yes. Um, there's a there's a two there's a twofold uh viewpoint yes, on that. Sir. Uh you have some Hebrew or mores that says the abomination that makes desolate is when the um when um antagonist offers the pig at the altar. Mm -hmm in 175 BCE. Yeah. They, you have many that say that is the abomination that makes desolate. Um, history don't necessarily, I don't think history agrees with that for this reason. The Romans, when they sacked Jerusalem in 70 AD, they made it desolate, no more. And not only did they make it desolate, but they performed a ritual, su suave to really. Mm -hmm. So what happens when they perform the Suave Terilia, it's a five-year ritual where they're purging Jerusalem from all its culture, all its religion. They called it superstition, which would be religion. Mm -hmm. And they offer a pig also on the altar. They offer two other animals that are absolutely, uh, that's abomination to Israel, not just the right. pig, but what they did, Titus, before he burns the temple down, they just totally shamed the altar of, of Judah, of Jerusalem. And then they made the place desolate. Yeah. They killed man, woman, and child. Mm -hmm. They had heads that they cut off and lined up from Jerusalem for as far as the eye could see of, the, of, of those rebel Jews that fought them in 70 AD. The Hamites also helped in that. And we know that a Hellenized Jew was their greatest general. If you study Roman history, they'll tell you the greatest general they had in 70 AD was Tiberius Alexandria. Tiberius Alexandria is black. Yeah. He's a Jew. He's from the tribe of Judah. He put it down so that he could advance in the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. He was also a governor in Judea before he advanced in the Roman Empire. So when you say the, the abomination that makes desolate, yes, sir. Um, you'll have two different opinions on that. Some will say that it's when antagonists in 175 def defaced the temple. Mm -hmm. But the problem with that is the high priest Jason was all for it. He had no problem. He was wanting to be a Greek. He wanted to be accepted in the Greek culture so bad that he embraced it. So technically, the abomination would have had to been on the high priest of Jerusalem. Judah would have had to be guilty through the high priest of that desolation. As with the Romans, the high priest were standing in the holy place dying to prevent the desolation, the mm -hmm. abomination that makes desolate. And then they desolated the place. So me, my own, my view based on mm -hmm. studying history, yeah. the abomination that makes desolate to me would have to be 70 AD. I understand why a lot of mores point to um, when um, when antagonists did it, but the problem is the high priest Jason was all for it. He had no problem with it. That's why the Hasmodeans left Jerusalem because he was totally in agreement with anything that would make him give him Greek citizenship. That's why if you study history, you find that Jerusalem was called 
Antioch, Jerusalem, which was just yeah. flat out abomination. Right. Amen. So, so the so the mindset that is permeated now that be, until we before we came from darkness to light, we mm -hmm. were uh, living under other people's approval and other people's opinion. So what you just said supported that false theory mm -hmm. until we uh, uh, come out from among them and begin to walk in the proper instruction. Amen. 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 Very well put. Hallelujah. In, in, you good, uh, Moray uh, uh, Richardson? Well, you know, I'm going to always be hungry. But, uh, <laughs> I'm, I, I'm just overjoyed and, and can't wait till I get a chance to listen to it because um, I thank the Most High that he's always on time. Hallelujah. And that if we learn how to wait on him in due season, see, we just entered into a new year. So now he's bringing us into the proper understanding if you're yielding that you know sometimes when you turn that plate over it leads you to some areas that might be uncomfortable but those are the areas that's going to help you grow. I mean, uh, so, uh, I'm looking forward to the instruction that uh, Moray gave because I know that uh, uh, the supplications that have been offered up are lining up for such a time as this. Amen. We have uh, um, uh, Pastor uh, Wickens coming um, in November to North Carolina from uh, Louisville, Kentucky um, for the Set Apart Conference. Um, so Amen. we're excited uh, for him coming um, to share a word uh, with the people. We're going to sit at the Amen. table of brotherly and sisterly love Amen. and Amen. break bread Hallelujah. together. Hallelujah. Now, now, now more a, um, uh, Wilkins, do you mind coming back and doing a part two? I'll do what you ask, my brother, because we have to understand the message of the Messiah and what the message that Paul said he had are not the same message. Mm -hmm. yeah. that's, that's where the confusion come from. The message from the Messiah and what Paul said his message was, was not the same message. Moray, uh, Moray Lyons, uh, he's, he lays this out beautifully how Paul's testimony changed three times yeah. when he gave his testimony. Um, we don't have an apostle that witnessed Paul's um, conversion in the desert. We know out of the mouth of two or more witnesses, every word of the truth shall be established, but yet there was no apostle that witnessed that conversion. I'm not questioning Paul, but if we're going to get into the message of the Messiah versus the message of Paul, then there has to be some things in history that has to be brought up to understand it's not the same message. Paul's telling us that the Messiah gave him a message that is not the message that he gave the other apostles. Is that true? What does history say? That's where it has to be decided. Amen. Amen. So um, I guess I'll get with you tomorrow and you can let me know when you're you're available. Um, you and the sons of y'all, the inner circle, you know, I, I'm available to you whenever you need me. I'll, well, uh, what does your next Wednesday look like? It's up to you. You tell me. Well, I'm, I'm available good. to you. I'm good. I'm a servant. You tell me and I, I, I serve. So next Wednesday is good. Same time. I got you. I got you. Hallelujah. Is there anyone else that wants to ask? I will be there. I will be there. <laughs> Hallelujah. I, I, any other questions uh, to the Moray? I have I, one more question. I have one more question, if that's okay. Sure. Um, when you talked about the um, um, the destruction of the temple also, <laughs> um, in that, um, I... Um, was listening to um, another uh, Moray um, while I was enjoying my um, day off. Um, <laughs> is it true that the um, also that um, sexual immorality um, was performed in in um, the desecration 
of the um, the temple? Was there sexual acts performed um, to you know disrespect our 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 father? It spilled over into the temple. What happened was the Greeks had gymnasiums, which is a gymnasium to us in English. In this gymnasium, you had to be in there in the nude. You could not be in the gymnasium, and it was it was a, it was basically for males. So men were naked in the gymnasium. What they did, they learned in the gymnasium. They had sports in the gymnasium, and they had leisure time in the gymnasium. Many of our people were gay, dealing with the gymnasium in 175. Uh, the high priest Jason did not mind that. The only goal of the high priest Jason was to be recognized as a Greek citizen. So if they needed to move this immorality anywhere in Jerusalem, including the temple, they had the free reign to do so. This is why you hear the rise of the Maccabees, because our, our men were being softened by the gymnasium. Again, you had sports in there. It was for higher learning in there. And, and here's the problem. Jason and a lot of Jews, the high priest Jason and a lot of Jews, they wanted Greek scholarship because you can advance through Greek scholarship. It's like sororities today. Pledging Greek scholarship can get you a long way mm -hmm. in the, what, Western society. Mm -hmm. Kappa Beta, you can go a long way on Kappa Beta. Well, that's, that goes all the way back to the gymnasium of over 2,300 years ago when the Greeks brought that into Jerusalem, Judea, and the surrounding parts of our people. So when the gymnasium is being practiced, and guess what? People of the temple that were also trying to get that higher education were more submissive to man sleeping with man. This was happening. So yes, you're telling the truth. That's a good question, but yes. And the reason that I asked that question is because now more than ever, we're talking about even now in modern time, mm -hmm. homosexuality, transgender, um, non-binary and all of this. And it seems like it's a new thing, but actually, it goes back in history because the, uh, the Moray was saying that the, the Greeks and the Romans were huge when it came to homosexuality in their culture. And they literally used that as uh, worshiping the uh, Hasatai. So that's the reason why I asked that question when it came to um, Moray um, Richardson talking about the uh, the desecration. Um, He's telling the truth. That is part, true. Is that a part of that 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 mess that went on? So we know you. that emperors of the uh, Julio Claudian dynasty uh, was it Octavius? It's in my notes. I'll go in my notes and get it. But I believe Octavius was married and he also had a lover. And he's, I believe he's the first emperor. Yes, he's the first emperor of Rome. You had five emperors that were the high priest of Rome as well as being the emperor. They were the Pontifus Maximus. And if I'm not mistaken, Octavius was, um, he had a lover. He had a male lover and he also had a wife. But I'll go in my research papers and make sure I got that correct. But I'm almost for sure it's Octavius, which would be Augustus, a man. Okay, thank you so very much, sir. And then you're gonna have to do a lesson on that one too. Whenever, yes, you, whenever you get a chance. Thank you yes, so much, sir. Amen. Okay, as we get ready to wind down, um, 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 is there anyone else that wants to ask uh, Moray a, a question or a comment? I did. I okay. did good evening, hello warm everyone. I just wanna ask um, Moray Wilkins, um, and I might be stretching there. Um, I remember I used to have um, Bible studies on, on Thursdays weekly. And um, I kind of missed that. I got, um, I'm, haven't been able to catch up with him like I should, like I wanted to. So I just wanted to ask him if he, he's, um, you know, when, if he's going to um, do it again, you know, regularly. Because I, I was, you know, that was the time I was able to catch up with him. And I kind of like lost track completely, it seemed like. Amen. 
Um, I'm so far behind right now with chasing our history. I got to be at the Devil's Punch Bowl um, here sometime. I, I have to be there within the next six weeks. I don't pinpoint the exact time because these places are dangerous. When, when I show up there, that's when I go live, but I won't say I'll be at the Devil's Punch Bowl next week. It's too dangerous. Okay. Um, so I'm so far behind on chasing our history because of this thing they call the pandemic that once I can get caught up on chasing our history, then I will go back into these uh, Bible studies. But the research that's required to be on these plantations and to be in a scholarly level, it just it's time consuming. So that's why I don't you don't see me like you was because my timing's off and the research. I would be disrespectful to y'all if I was giving you history and I didn't have proper research. Okay. When I tell the sons of y'all research team, you have to be fallible up to at least the 8.5. Nobody's absolute in research, but we need to be at least the 8.5. Okay. And so that's that's the model I carry. You can't be absolute in research because it, like if you take Herodotus, the Greek historian, the Greek scholar uh, Herodotus, the historian, he says that the Greeks um, imported religion from the Afri from the Ethiopians, from the uh, Egyptians. Well, you'll have other scholars that says that he can't make that claim because he wasn't physically in Egypt. And it's not they have trying to debunk that claim, it's the other claim that he makes that they're trying to debunk through Egyptology. He tells us that um, the Egyptians were Ethiopians and the word Ethiopian is anthemathia, which is a Greek term for dark face, burnt face people. So when he connects that dot to the Egyptians, we know the Messiah went, was hidden in Egypt, then it tells you that clearly he was burnt face. And then we understand that Tatticus also writes that the Jews were Ethiopian in descent, in character, in, in, in characteristics, in their look. And we know that Ethiopia, again, is Anamathia, which is to say a Black people, a burnt face people. So I can't be absolute in my research. No one can other than the Messiah himself. But that's why you haven't seen me that much on Thursday. I want to be as close as I can get. Okay. That's what you're saying for me. So I do apologize, but the pandemic has put me behind. Okay. And just want to well, just to let you know who I am, I um, have Sandra on here because um, I'm you're usually on Zoom as well, but I'm, I'm um, FJB Moore. I'm in. Okay, okay. Just want to let you know who I am. Are we friends? We friends on Facebook? Yes, sir. Um, SJB Praise Moore. Okay. Yes. Yes, sir. Praise y'all. Right. Praise y'all for you. Praise y'all for you too. Amen. Maury Wilkins, um, is there any more room left on uh, the sons of Yah? Uh, and if is if so, is it uh, secluded just to men, or is it available to women as well? Oh no, we women are important. Um, the a lot of that good research that we get come from our research team. The head of the research department is a woman, J.C. Lords, and uh, she she's good. The inner circle has to be the men because of government. We understand that uh, there were 12 apostles and that's important when you start dealing with uh, government and uh, the 12 tribes of Israel. The 12 apostles represent, I believe, they represent the tribe of Israel because what we don't talk enough about is the Hellenize, Hellenization of the Jews that has totally threw everything in a tailspin because even after the Messiah, Jews were still messed up. Our people got messed up through the Greeks and the Romans. They got messed up bad. The only thing that messed our people up worse than the Greeks and the Romans would be the Atlantic slave trade. Yeah, That's the only thing greater than that period that messed us up. We got messed up. Okay. Oh, man. Moray, um, um, if anyone wanted to, to get in contact or contact you, uh, and the sons of Yah, how would they go about doing that? 
send me um, an email, but better yet, send me, put it in my messenger that you would like to be involved. It can be sent to me. Um, I'm asking that they would send it to you and uh, JC Lord, and then our executive director, Stephen Greer. But I don't, I don't talk to Stephen Greer as much as I do JC Lord or you yourself. Okay. So if it's coming through one of those channels, it's going to get received. Yes, sir. Uh, um, with, and so we'll interview them as well. So. Yes, sir. I know um, to those that are uh, just tuning in, um, you can also uh, reach uh, Pastor Wilkins uh, on the new email, which is the sons of Yah uh, 144 at gmail.com. That's the sons of Yah, sons of Yah 144 at gmail.com. And also, we're currently working on a website uh, for Amen. the sons of Yah as well, um, which will be up soon, very soon. Um, they also have a, a YouTube, which is the Sons of Yah uh, channel, so you can actually go there as well. Um, there's some great things that uh, Pastor yes. Wilson is working on, y'all. Uh, I, if I hadn't seen it with my own eyes, I wouldn't have believed it. And 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 it's and I love, what I love about it, uh, Pastor Wilkins, is for us, is for Amen. our people, Amen. and it's all about our people, you Amen. know. Um, and I'm I'm excited to be a part of it. Amen. We praise y'all for you too, Maury. We praise y'all for you. You are talented. Most of all, you are anointed, and we praise y'all for that anointing. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Is there anyone anyone else need to say anything or ask the question before we close out? Okay, well, at this time, I'm going to ask um, Pastor Wilkins, if you would, to give his final uh, comments and, um, and then close us out in prayer. Amen. I'm going to say this. We, we have to understand, we, even when you say part two, we have to bring Paul's equation into this. I, I don't like touching Paul much because I'm one of his biggest critics. I'm not saying Paul's not legit. I'm saying there are some uh, areas that need to be addressed when dealing with Paul. And, and it's based on the law, stature, and commandment. We are commanded two or more witnesses. The guys that he say witnessed that in the desert are not traditional Jews. Those are not witnesses. Tor keepers are witnesses. Stat law, statute, and commandments are witnesses. These people were after, they were after the apostles. So we know they was not credible witnesses because that's discord against the brethren. Even though he was not awakened, we'll go into that in detail. But that's, I want people to understand if you ask me to do part two, it will get critical on Paul. It will get very critical. Let's get it. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Oh, by the way, we'll, we'll be back again um, um, 7 o'clock next, next Wednesday um, with uh, Pastor Wilkins um, and with, this, um, with the second episode, um, second portion. And as he explained, we'll be going into different areas um, that a lot of people don't like to touch. But um, I'm 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 like L Lorraine. I'm hungry right now. <laughs> I'm about to start. So Amen. so um, if you would, if you don't mind, uh, Pastor Wilkins, to close this out on tonight. Yes, sir. Abba Yah, Most High, we thank you for the word on tonight. We thank you for the fellowship with Seven Day Harvest. We give you all honor, all glory, all praise. We exalt you for the brethren. For the fellowship amongst the brethren is huge. Though we might not all agree as the awakening on all things, we got to be somewhere in the ballpark when it comes to information. Yes. We praise you for each and every person that is awake, for every moray, for every wife of, an amor of a moray, for everyone that's going forth in this truth, we ask you to sustain them, to sanctify them in thy word, for thy word is true. We pray these things in Hamashiach's name, and this we ask in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you all so much for tuning in um, uh, to our um, broadcast, to our live talk.
discussion. We hope that something was said, something was done um, that changed your mind uh, towards the right direction, towards the Most High Yah. So we again say we love you, Ahaba Shalom and Shalom. Uh, uh, take care of yourself. And uh, as we depart from uh, this place, but not from his presence, Amen. we say Shalom. Shalom. Amen. Shalom. Shalom. Amen. Shalom.